All right, a more perfect you, the pursuit of perfection in Christ. This is lesson number two, conditional or actual perfection. That's the name of the, name of the class. Last week uh, we began our series, uh, as I mentioned, uh, entitled A More Perfect You, Living by the, or rather the uh, Pursuit of Perfection in Christ. And uh, in that lesson I questioned the validity of the title that comes from a, uh, a book that I mentioned. And the point was, how can you be more perfect? How does that work? How can you improve on perfection? The title kind of provokes you to kind of think about that. Well, grammatically, you can't because the word perfect refers to something that doesn't need improvement, right? Of course, the meaning of words are sometimes inadequate to express fully the reality of spiritual truths, as in the case with Christians and the issue of perfection. So last week we also talked about the various ways that perfection was sought after by different religious and secular groups. And I'm, not, I'm not going to repeat all of that, but we talked about that last time. We also reviewed against these many ideas what the Bible taught concerning the Christian's pursuit of perfection and found that the series title actually did make a lot of sense. For Christians, becoming more perfect is the essence of their Christian life. That's the whole series in a nutshell, right there. For Christians, becoming more perfect is the essence of their Christian life. Of course, this only makes sense if you understand that there are two aspects of perfection in the Christian's understanding. And again, we talked about that last week. So let's look at that. Two aspects of perfection. One, conditional perfection. This is the perfect state one enters into when one obeys the gospel. You obey the gospel and what God condones, uh, not condones, what God puts onto you, what God gives to you is perfection. Some people come to Christ when they're you know, 60 years old. And uh, at the time that they're baptized, God imputes, that's the word I was looking for, God imputes on that 60 year old perfection. My young grandson is in the class uh, this morning. And how old were you, 10, 11, nine, when you were baptized? 10, so when he was 10 years old and he was baptized, God imputed on him perfection. The same perfection that was on the 60 year old when they were baptized was imputed on him when he was baptized. So this is the perfect state that we enter into when, one we, when we obey the gospel. And the Bible refers to this in various ways throughout the New Testament. Saved means the same thing as being perfect. Born again, same thing as being perfect in God's eyes. Justified, Romans 3.24. Washed, redeemed, righteous. These are, only, these are just different ways to describe the same thing, basically. All ways of expressing the results of receiving forgiveness and reconciliation with God through faith in Jesus Christ, His Son. You, you receive all of these things, but all of these things mean you're perfect in God's eyes. You can't, you can't get it, you remember I said, you can't get any more saved, you can't get any uh, 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 more righteous than the righteousness that God imputes on you when you become a Christian. We understand the gospel meaning. The death of Jesus pays our moral debt. It makes restitution for what we've done. Some people confuse repentance with restitution. They think repentance means you got to do restitution. You got to make up for all the bad things you did. That's a hard life, my friends. We need to understand the essence of the gospel is that Jesus, with His death on the cross, He makes restitution for all the bad, dumb, selfish, evil, lustful things that we have done in our life. Whatever payment 
whatever moral payment is owed because of what we did, He makes payment for that on the cross. We don't. And when we receive Him through faith, expressed in repentance and baptism, we are purified of all sin, all blame, and all spiritual imperfection. So because of our faith in Christ, we are considered perfect in the eyes of God, or as the Bible says, saved, justified, washed, purified. You know. We'd get bored if it kept using the same word all the time and the same imagery all the time to describe the same thing. So in the Bible, it's described in a variety of ways, but it's always the same thing. Now the jewel, for example, perfection is like a jewel. And if you hold a jewel, you know, a precious stone up to the light, and you kind of look at it different ways, it reflects different ways, doesn't it? Well, it's the same thing. The jewel is perfection in Christ. You kind of hold it up to the light of truth and you see it in all kinds of various ways. It's always the same thing. So this conditional perfection has absolutely nothing to do with our performance or our actions or our effort. Zero. It is given to us freely as a covering to guarantee our entry into heaven when the time comes. We don't earn it, we can't improve it, we can't buy it, we can't work our way into it. It's a gift, it's given to us. You know the lesson of the thief, you know, on the cross, you know, the thief next to Jesus? Many use that as an, excuse, or an, ex, an argument to say you don't need to be baptized, and that's a, that's a long argument, you know, while Jesus is on earth, he's able to forgive sins directly. After Jesus goes to heaven, he gives the apostles the commission to go out and do what? Make disciples of all nations, doing what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's a fake argument. You know. The real lesson of the thief on the cross is that he was imputed conditional perfection moments before he died. You know, some people think, well, he never went to church, he never did anything, he never, you know, he never performed any good deeds, nothing. How come he went to heaven? He, he received conditional perfection. It's what you need to go to heaven. So when God looks at us as the judge of all mankind, he will see the covering of our conditional perfection not the degree of actual perfection we have obtained. This is why Paul can say in Romans chapter three, where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith, for we maintain that man is justified by faith apart from works of law. He's saying here, basically, you are considered perfect by God because you believe in Jesus Christ. And this is where and why the other type of perfection enters the picture. And the other type of perfection is actual perfection. Actual perfection, again, you don't read that in the Bible, that's my term to try to describe something that we, we see in the Bible, to kind of be able to handle it, work with it. Actual perfection is the actual progress that we make in spiritual development while we are still here in this imperfect body living in this fallen world. You see, if, 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 uh, if we went to heaven straight from baptism, that would be great. We wouldn't be teaching a class on actual perfection. You know, because when you're baptized, you know, God imputes on you conditional perfection. You're, you're good to go. It'd be nice if we could just go from the water to, to heaven. But it doesn't work that way, does it? No, there's the water 
And then there's a kind of a shorter, long period of time here in this world, this fallen world living inside this body. So Christ is actually the perfect human ideal and being like Him is the Christian's spiritual goal. So when we are saved, if you want to use the word justified, if you want to use the word born again, if you want to use the word received conditional perfection, whatever word you want to use, when we are in this way, God bestows on us the state of perfection and here's the point, which Jesus already has. You're saying this conditional perfection, what's it like? Look at Jesus, the perfection you see in Him, that's the quality of perfection that is given to us by faith. That's the gift. So when we are saved and justified, born again, whatever, God bestows on us the state of perfection which Jesus already has. Jesus achieved this perfect state because He obeyed the law perfectly and He obeyed the Father perfectly. In other words, Jesus earned or worked for the state of perfection by His actions and His life. He did it. He lived perfectly according to the law. He obeyed the Father perfectly. No mistakes, no sin. Every action was done with pure motives. Every effort to serve God perfectly achieved. And so he earned this, not as God, but as man, right? As, as a man, he earned the perfection. We, on the other hand, are given this status because of God's grace. It's just given to us. And we receive the status of perfection, why? Because we believe in Jesus Christ. Through faith, we are considered as perfect as Jesus is. Now here's the important thing to remember. <clears throat> Through faith, we are considered as perfect as Jesus is, not in our eyes or in men's eyes, but in God's eyes. When man looks at me, <laughs> well, he sees all kinds of imperfection. When I look at me, oh man, I really see imperfection because I know me. But when God looks at me, He sees conditional perfection. He sees the perfection of Christ. Now the problem, as I've mentioned before, is that we, the ones considered perfect by God, we live imperfect lives here in this imperfect world while we await the end of our physical lives. So what will we do with this time? Will we go back? to doing the sinful and ungodly things that led us to condemnation in the first place? Is that what we're going to do? How can we, who are considered perfect by God in Christ before all the angels in heaven, how can we dishonor our God and Savior with such actions and attitudes? Or as Paul says in Romans 6 verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? That's the point he's saying. God's grace has given us this conditional perfection. What are we going to do? Are we going to go back to sinning so that God's grace you know, can churn out perfection for us? Really? We're going to do that? So the answer, of course, is a resounding no. How can we, who are considered perfect by God, actually pursue imperfection as a lifestyle anymore. It makes no sense. So what then is the alternative for us? Well, the alternative is I will pursue the perfection that has been revealed to me in Christ Jesus. This then is what I refer to as actual perfection. It is the day-to-day -day effort that Christians make to imitate the perfect Christ. Now the Bible has also words for this as well. This exercise of seeking after the perfection we see in Christ, this actual perfection. 
It calls it by different names. Sanctification, Romans 6, 19. Faithfulness, 3 John 5. Perseverance, Ephesians 6, 18. Holiness, Colossians 3, 12. All these words refer to the same thing. Our effort at actual perfection. Our effort at imitating the perfection of Christ. As those who are considered perfect in Christ, we choose to pursue actual perfection through Christ. And we do this because Christ calls us to this exercise of pursuing perfection as a way of life. It's our lifestyle, it's not a hobby, it's a lifestyle. It permeates everything that we do, everything that we say. Paul talks about this in Romans 12, familiar verse. He says, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Well, there it is. There's my life. My life is worship. My, whole, my worship isn't just a Sunday morning at 10, 30. My whole life is worship. It's a living and holy sacrifice. Same thing, the pursuit of actual perfection. That's what he's talking about. And do not be conformed to this world. Well, what did I say before? What are you going to do? You've got a choice to make. You who are considered perfect in Christ, you're going to go back to the old way? You're going to pursue, actually pursue imperfection like you used to in your ignorance? So Paul says right here, don't, don't be conformed to this world. Don't, don't do that. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable. Oh, oh and perfect. What is good and acceptable and perfect? Well, that you are pursuing Christ-likeness. That's, what, that's what's good and acceptable and perfect. That's, that's exactly what you ought to do as a Christian. So this is Paul's way of encouraging Christians to pursue the road to perfection rather than the road to imperfection. So to follow act after actual perfection consciously is important because if we refuse or neglect to do so, the pull of our imperfect past will draw us back into the life that will ultimately destroy our faith and the conditional perfection that it produces. It's not a game, brothers and sisters. It's not a game. This business of heaven and hell is the truth. It's the reality. And we're between those. I think one of the greatest disservices that has taken place is the idea that once we become Christians, nothing we can ever do can you know, bring us to lose our, our salvation. That is a dangerous teaching. And I realize it more and more as I get more and more you know, feedback from, from Bible talk. People who take exception to the fact that uh, I'm teaching the idea that we must preserve our faith, we must preserve our souls, we can lose our salvation. Now, it's not, you know, if I hit my finger with a hammer, rah, 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 bad words come out of my mouth, whoops, I'm lost. Well, no, of course not. You know. The Bible describes in various places, especially Hebrews 6, 1 to 6, uh, the continual practice of sin, the continual rejection of Christ, the continual going away from all the things that are Christ-like eventually will bring us to a point where we're on the verge of losing what we had. So, but I, I'm just saying it's a serious business that what we're doing here. And you're either pursuing perfection consciously or you're pursuing imperfection unconsciously. You know, the question, what will I do with my life? It's not about, well, I'm going to become a farmer or I'm going to be a fire chief or something like that. Those are all professions. We all have to earn a living somehow. But what am I actually going to do with my life? The answer to that question is, I will pursue perfection in Christ. And it doesn't matter how I earn a living. I can be a cop or I can be an accountant. It doesn't matter what I am to, to put bread on the table. Usually try to choose something you're good at. Try to choose something you like to do. But the important decision is what will I pursue? 
as a cop or as an accountant or as a teacher, or as a secretary, whatever, what will I pursue? I will pursue actual perfection because it will inform every one of my decisions as a cop, as a teacher, as a this, as a that. And so we have the two, conditional perfection, which is the state freely given to us because of our faith in Christ and which will be the covering protecting us at judgment. I'm a Christian, I'm doing my best, I'm trying, and maybe I'm having not such a great day. I'm feeling discouraged. I've, I've, I've not you know, done the, some of the things that I know that I can do and that I should do. And it just so happens that on that day I die. And I go to God in judgment. I wasn't doing great on the day that I died. What's going to happen to me? Well, you're not, you're not being judged based on how well you were doing on the day you died. You're being judged as one who has conditional perfection. That's your confidence. I'm confident to try to be like Christ because I know that I've already won the game as far as judgment is concerned. I'm saved. So I pursue Christ with enthusiasm. I'm not afraid to fail, to try, to keep going because the, you know, my victory is locked in. And then there's actual perfection. The spiritual exercise we pursue while in this sinful state in order to confirm our faith before God and, and man. And so the more perfect you in the title refers to, or what it refers to, is the you who is constantly striving to draw closer to the perfection of Christ while in this human form. In other words, the conditionally perfect you striving each day to achieve actual perfection as both a witness of faith before men and a declaration of faith before God. You know, how do I, I know how to express my love to my wife because I know the things that she likes and I understand the things that she appreciates. So I know how to express my love to her. And if I want to have a good relationship with her, I will do those things. But how do I express my love to God? He's a spirit. You know, I, I can't hold him. I can't kiss him. It's interesting that the word worship in the original language means to kiss forward. You know how you blow a kiss to someone? Well, the word worship in the original the Bible language is meant, means exactly that, to kiss and to send forward. So how do I kiss forward to God? Well, I worship Him. And how do I worship Him? Well, I do this on Sundays, of course, a formal type of worship, community worship, okay? public worship. But every day I worship Him by, by pursuing uh, actual perfection. For the Christian, there's no other option for his or her life. Putting off the pursuit of actual perfection in every aspect of life is either a sign of weak faith or a compromise with the world, a sign of lack of gratitude for Christ or a show of love for sins, great and small. Now, I know I've repeated this idea a lot of different ways, but it's the, it's the thing that confuses most Christians, most of the time, I'm not talking about marriage counseling or that type of counseling, but most of the time when I'm doing spiritual counseling, pastoral counseling, when someone is discouraged in their faith or they're afraid that they're not good enough or they're afraid they're not going to go to heaven and you know, when, when that's the problem and, and it shows itself in various forms, the problem is usually a misunderstanding of what we're talking about here. Formally, the problem is usually, uh, or doctrinally, the problem is the person confuses justification with sanctification. Justification, that's that conditional perfection. I am justified before God on the day that I am saved. The day I go down into the waters of baptism and wash away all my sins and receive the Holy Spirit and I am considered perfect before God, I am justified. That happens one time in my life, only once. 
It only has to happen once. God doesn't have to have a do-over, you know? Oh wait, I forgot that other sin. You didn't tell me about that other sin back in 1941, you know? <laughs> They're all gone, all the sins. That's justification, one time, forever. Sanctification is a process over a lifetime, whether it's a two year lifetime or a nine decade lifetime. Sanctification is a process. And people confuse the two. They think that they're saved based on how well their sanctification process is going. Sometimes it's going well and sometimes it's going slow and they think, oh no, you know, they don't realize you're saved, boom, that's it, it's done, once for all. The process of sanctification is how you live your life as a Christian. Some people progress very quickly, others are more slowly. That's why we have elders in the church, and that's why we have teachers in the church, and that's why we have deacons in the church, that's why, we have, that's why God you know, commands us to come together on a, on a regular basis to worship and to fellowship and to, 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 to teach God's word. Why? Because that's, that, that doesn't do anything for justification, we have that already. That helps the process of sanctification. It helps us remain faithful. It helps us to know how to serve. It helps us to grow in our faith. And it helps us to you know, improve our conduct. How? Well, the preachers and the teachers are talking about what proper conduct for a Christian is all about in class, from the pulpit, by example. So I, I've repeated this thing in a different way from last week, but I want us to truly grasp this principle be, before we go to the actual text itself. You know, in Galatians 5, Paul will list a sampling of the conduct that reflects what an individual is pursuing, especially one who claims that he is a Christian. The bottom line here is easy to understand, but not easy to do. What you are really pursuing, imperfection or actual perfection, will be evident by a sampling of the fruit that you bear. Understanding this is easy, but accepting that you're heading the wrong way and changing course, that, that's not always easy. Or accepting the idea <clears throat> that sometimes your life you know, as far as fruitfulness is concerned, you know, the, the, the product of sanctification, the product of, of your actual perfection, the progress of that. You know, in the, uh, in the parable of the, uh, the sower and the seed, at the very end, you know, Jesus is explaining this parable, right? And what does he say about this? Some seed goes on the hard ground, doesn't have anything. Some seed goes on the rocky ground, it grows for a while, disappears. You know, and, and then he finally says, and then some seed goes into the good earth you know, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it, it, it has a harvest. And he could have ended it there. But he says it has a harvest, sometimes 30-fold, sometimes 60-fold, sometimes 100-fold. It's very interesting that he puts that caveat at the end. Why? Because human nature does not always produce 100% good fruit. The pursuit of actual perfection that I'm talking about does not always in our lives enable us to, to produce 100% good fruit. Sometimes our best efforts at doing what Christ wants us to do, sometimes our most sincere efforts only produce a 30-fold harvest. Sometimes 90-fold. You know, a uh, I, I, friend of mine said uh, that a, a young person, uh, they had discovered the body of a young person who had committed suicide, 20, he was 24 years old, you know, and he left a note on the internet saying, this is the only way. How sad, 24 young men, 24 years old. And um, 
psychologists who study you know, this particular phenomenon, you know, suicide among young people, uh, I read uh, one of the causes of it is that uh, young people have not been around the track much. When you get to be 40 years old, you understand that life goes up and down and up and down and up and down. When you're young, you think life is supposed to go from low, a, a, a continual, it just keeps on getting better and better and it just, you just keep on going and going. And so when things go badly for a young person, they think all is lost. Because, well, well, wait a minute, I'm down. I'm supposed to keep going up and up. Everything's supposed to be successful. That's what Kim Kardashian tells me. That's what YouTube tells me. Some guy puts a video, you know, some crazy video on, he gets 10 million hits. You know, he's, a, he's a video, he's an internet millionaire. You know, life is supposed to be like that. But when you're 24 and your girlfriend breaks off with you and you, you lose your job and uh, you, know, you, you get sick, you, know, you, you, you think that that's, your life is over. Lack of experience many times leads a young person to think life will never get better. But those of us who've lived a while, we understand. Things turn around, things kind of get better. Well, it's the same thing, if you're wondering, where's the correlation here? <laughs> it's the same thing with the pursuit of actual perfection. We enter into it enthusiastically as young Christians, but after you've been a Christian five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, you realize, yeah, that there, this is an up and down life here. Sometimes I'm very fruitful for the Lord, and then sometimes a pretty dry period. And it's a good thing that we understand especially during the period of, of dry period, that we're saved because we have conditional perfection and not because our pursuit of perfection is always you know, 100%, is always producing 100%. There are dry spells in there and sometimes there are very long dry spells. All right, well next time we're going to get to the text and we're going to start reviewing a sampling of imperfection and the relationship, this time the relationship between the Holy Spirit and perfection. What does the Holy Spirit have to do with perfection? Conditional perfection and actual perfection. Well, that's it for today. Thank you very much for your attention.